We'll continue our series on the Bible, how God gave it and how we ought to receive it. And we're still in this section speaking about doctrine, the doctrines of the Bible. What should we believe about the Bible? And now we're still in this uh, part about the doctrine of preservation. We've already established uh, that the scriptures are the infallible, inerrant, authoritative word of God. And now we're just asking the question, have these scriptures been preserved so that we continue to have access to them today? And uh, we've already said, has God promised to preserve uh, the scriptures? Yes, he has. So we know that it's happened. The question is now, how has God preserved the scriptures? And uh, we've uh, been making the case that God has providentially preserved the biblical text in spite of copying errors. Because remember, all this was done by hand, manuscripts being copied. But we're, uh, we're uh, speaking about how we can compare what God has preserved in the manuscripts and still have the original biblical text. And last time we spoke about uh, this Westcott and Hort theory of uh, textual criticism. And uh, here, just as a reminder, here's what they said, that the text reflected in the vast majority of later extant manuscripts is the result of a long, uncontrolled process of editorial activity. That's sort of how it's been modified today. So uh, they're, they're saying that the, uh, the unified text that you see in the uh, the vast majority of the Greek manuscripts that we have, they say, well, that's later. You really need to go back to these handful of earlier manuscripts, and these are the best ones. And so that's what they say. Therefore, the most reliable witnesses to the original text prior to all this editorial work are these earlier extant manuscripts. And remember, there's just a small, uh, small number of these that we have. And so uh, the two big ones, this uh, ends up being you rely very heavily on these two manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And, uh, but then we spoke last time, maybe is there a simpler explanation than to say that there was this uh, uncontrolled process that somehow produced this uniform text? What if the vastly predominant form of the text is actually what most closely reflects the original autographs? Uh, instead of trying to go back and rebuild and reconstruct the text, what if the text that has been preserved in the great bulk of manuscripts is what reflects the originals? That is a simpler explanation. And that's actually what you would expect. As these uh, autographs were sent uh, to different places and then as they were multiplied over time, you would expect that the consensus of all these copies would give you the uh, original text. And that's sort of this uh, counter argument to Westcott and Hort that we called the Byzantine priority theory. So that, this, this says that the text reflected in the vast majority of later extant manuscripts is the result of a long uncontrolled process of faithful copying. In other words, scribes were not en masse making, uh, taking it upon themselves to change the text. They were just copying, by and large, they were just copying what was in front of them. And as that process just continues without any central control, it preserves the entire biblical text. So what would you want to do? Therefore, the dominant consensus text of the entire manuscript tradition will most closely reflect the original text. And I think that's probably the better way to look at it. You don't want to just uh, hang everything on a small group of witnesses, even though they may be early, and they, they appear to be. Uh, but you can't just ignore what's been preserved in the vast body of uh, existing manuscripts. And we gave some different uh, critiques of reason, reasoned eclecticism. That's how this moder modified Westcott Hort theory is put into practice today. We're not going to go over all that. I think that was probably getting too far into the weeds, but uh, I just wanted you to be aware of what this debate even was. And uh, the key question was this, should the vast majority of extant manuscripts really be overturned on the basis of a limited number of earlier extant manuscripts? And last time we said this, well, there are good reasons not to do that, not to overturn what we have in the consensus of the entire manuscript tradition. So uh, this morning, we just want to uh, dive a little deeper into 
What are these differences? What differences are there in the manuscripts? What are we even talking about? Remember uh, the last couple of times we spoke about how 94% of the New Testament text, there's really no question, no matter how you slice it, it's been established. And uh, it's really only the 6% difference that, you know, the Westcott and Horde theory or the Byzantine priority theory debate about. Well, what's in that 6%? What are these differences? Why are there differences between uh, the King James Bible, for instance, and then some of these modern versions? What explains the differences? Well, uh, we want to get a little bit closer into that. I think uh, if we just leave this to hazy generalities, it will be hard to form a clear idea of what's going on. We really need to bring this down to specifics. So there are three, uh, you can think about this, there are kind of three main views here that are going on. First you have, uh, there's still uh, many folks who just say, well, we just need to stick with the Textus Receptus. This was what was printed uh, uh, back in these, uh, this Reformation era, and this is what people have used for a few centuries now, and we just really don't need to tinker with it or tamper with it. Uh, some of these folks, as we said, would try to make it infallible, but there are also some people that say, well, you know, there may be some, uh, some, some small uh, defects or weaknesses in the Texas Receptus, but they're very minor. We just need to stick with this. You know, that is a legitimate view. Um, then there's also this Byzantine text view, which says, you know, instead of just going back to the printed edition that we've always used for a long time, we need to look at the entire manuscript tradition and look at the consensus of the manuscripts. That's really the best way to, to take a view of the text. And, uh, oh, just as a, another remark, this Textus Receptus view is very closely aligned with the Byzantine text. It's not like they're two different things. The Textus Receptus is basically a representation of the Byzantine text anyway. The differences are quite minimal. Um, but then there's the modern critical text view. And again, this is kind of that Westcott and Hort theory where they say, well, we don't need to look at the bulk of manuscripts. We need to really rely heavily on these earlier witnesses. And these are the three views that are kind of out there that, uh, that folks uh, adopt when they look at the New Testament. And so now we're going to see, well, what are the differences between these views? What does this actually mean when you come to the scriptures? What are the, uh, what are the passages that are, uh, that are different here? And we're going to try to speak about the, some of these major manuscript differences or variants. What are the differences between these two views? And we're going to try to tackle the biggest ones, the most significant ones first. So we're going to try to just bring it, jump right into what is the most significant difference between these. Um, and there's two, really, that stand out as the, the most significant differences. The first is the ending of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the verse is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. This is one significant difference between these views. So what's going on here with the ending of Mark? The Textus Receptus, and by extension, our King James Bible, and the Byzantine text, the majority of manuscripts, they contain the text that we have, Mark 16, 9 through 20. But the modern critical text does not contain Mark 16, 9 through 20. The last 12 verses are, uh, that we're familiar with are not there. It ends in verse 8, and that's it. So, you know, we're not going to read the whole ending of Mark, but here it is as it is in the Textus Receptus and the Byzantine text. You know, it starts out, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene and so forth. And He goes on to say, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it, it ends up, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And that's what we're used to reading at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Well, what about the critical text? Here's what you have in the critical text. It just sort of ends, as we said, in verse 8. So this is the last few verses before that. When this young man, the angel, was in the tomb, and he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, 
tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And that's the end. Now, uh, some folks, uh, you know, in the past couple of centuries have said, well, how do they explain this? How do they explain that it just ends here and they were afraid? Some people say, well, maybe there was, you know, Mark wrote some more and then it got lost. And then this is just where, this is as far as we had it. Or more people today now say Mark intentionally stopped here. They say this is how Mark actually wrote it. He wrote, for they were afraid. And that's how he wanted to end his gospel. Uh, well, let's, let's think a, bit, a little bit closer about this. Why would you even say this? What's, uh, the, it's, not just, it's not just people sitting around thinking about, you know, how do I want to change the Bible? It, ha it does have an evidential basis. What do they say? Oh, just as an example, here we go. If you look at a modern version like this, this is from the ESV. Well, well it will still have Mark 16, 9 through 20, but it will have notes like this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. And they'll also have this. You may not notice this, and you may not understand what this is. Most people who read it probably don't understand what this means. But do you see this? Double brackets. That means we're printing the text here, but we really don't think this is part of the text. We're still going to print it. You know, and I, I appreciate people wanting to accommodate people who do believe that this is part of the text. But... Uh, this is a bit problematic. Here, we're going to show you the text, even though we don't think it's <laughs> there. And uh, there are some, you know, preachers today who will speak about they're aware of this issue. And if they take this critical view, they say, well, it's in the Bible, but uh, it's in, it's printed in the Bible. But when I come to a preaching, I'm just not going to preach on it. Which, I mean, if you don't believe that it's original, of course you wouldn't. All right, so what's the, uh, what is the evidence? Why would anyone do this. Here's the case uh, against these verses being original. First, Mark 16, 9 through 20 are not contained in either Codex Vaticanus or Codex Sinaiticus. There's maybe one other Greek manuscript from uh, centuries later that would not have the full traditional ending of Mark, but it's basically these two. They say, oh, these two agree. Therefore, we have to follow them. This just goes right back to the Westcott Hort theory of these two manuscripts are our best window into the text, and whatever they say, we're going to have to follow it. There are people, essentially, this is carried down to the present day, and this is why some people reject these as being original. But that's not just that. There are a few early manuscripts that have alternative endings or notes suggesting that when the scribe was copying, they noticed that it wasn't in some manuscripts. Um, so, yeah, there are some manuscripts that have uh, the longer ending, but they also have these additional uh, alternative endings kind of beside them. And uh, these scholars would say, oh, there you go. It proves that people were having to cre create an ending to this gospel. Uh, a few fourth century writers uh, uh, like uh, Eusebius and Jerome basically was citing Eusebius. They said that this was missing in many manuscripts. So they say, well, there you go. So it says that they, they're telling us back then that it was, in, was not in, in, in at least some manuscripts. And then there, there's all, they also make an internal case. So that's the, that we call the external evidence, the manuscripts and what it is. The internal evidence is, does this match with what we read in the rest of the gospel? Does this match the style of Mark? Does it fit in with the context? Just looking at the text itself. And this is what they say. This, these last 12 verses have 17 words that do not appear anywhere else in Mark. And so they say, oh, there you go. This proves that someone else wrote it because he's using all these non marking words. Well, that sounds like a, a, a pretty good case. But let's think about the case for these verses. What would be the case for them? Well, number one, these 12 verses are contained in nearly all Greek manuscripts. Yes, we, there's the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. We'll have to deal with that. But if you look at basically every other Greek manuscript of Mark that, has, that you know, is complete in this section, they have the verses that appear in our Bibles and 
have been for centuries. And even Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus both suggest awareness of an ending's existence. This is important because it's not like their evidence is, uh, is just clear and uh, unequivocal. It is a little strange. So if you look at the last pages of these manuscripts, and uh, if you kind of zoom in to the end of the Gospel of Mark, you see, these, you see those little, that little decorative line, the two lines crossing. This is something that's unique, that's not really found elsewhere in these manuscripts. What is the scribe doing here? It's like he knows that someone might want to come and finish this off. And so they're blocking this. They're saying, no, this is where the text ends. I'm going to draw these little things in here so no one can add to the text. Now, what does that mean? We don't know. <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't know who these scribes were, what they were doing. But what it does reveal is they knew there were other endings. They knew that there was an ending. And some, for some reason, they wanted to uh, preclude it from being added. So anyway, the point is, even the evidence of these two manuscripts is a little strange and a little, we don't know exactly what to do with it. These verses are explicitly cited by second century Christian writers. So we said, oh, there were some fourth century writers that expressed that. If you look at some second century writers, they're saying, oh, in the Gospel of Mark, it says this about going all the world. It was in their Bibles in the second century. And if they're explicitly citing it, I think that overrides maybe some implicit doubt from these later writers, doesn't it? And this is important. What about all those unique words? Well, if you look at it, that sounds good. But actually, if you look at any pericope or section, little narrative section of the gospel, there are unique words in every one of those. So like even uh, several different sections, you'll, if you pick one out, that will have unique words that are not in any other of the sections. And actually, if you look at the proportion of these words, it's about the same as you would find in any other section. So the fact that it has unique words is what you would expect <laughs> from something that was original to this gospel. So that really doesn't, it sounds good, but it really is not determinative. And there are other reasons uh, for this. Is it really conceivable that Mark failed to mention the resurrection appearances when he wrote his gospel? To me, I, I can't wrap my mind around that, that he would intentionally not write about the appearances. It seems more reasonable to interpret this evidence as pointing to a scribal omission which affected one early line of transmission that would explain Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Maybe the exemplar that they were working for did lose the back page of Mark. That's possible. Their copy might have lost it, and that's why it was absent there. But why do we have it in every other manuscript? Well, it's because it's original. Now, what are the, what's the impact of this? You know, is our whole, let's say that the, other, let's say that the critical text view is right. Does that just demolish the entire Faith? No, it really doesn't. It, it, it's an, it, these are important verses, but not everything that we believe is based on the last 12 verses of Mark. So the resurrection appearances and what it says about Jesus' ascension, that's clearly paralleled elsewhere in unanimously attested passages in the Gospels and Acts. So uh, even if you said, even if you set aside the, 12, the last 12 verses of Mark, of course we know that Jesus appeared to his disciples. Of course we know that he ascended. These, these are not the only verses that we go to to establish that. Now, there is something that's unique to these last 12 verses, and that was Jesus' explicit promise of signs following those who believe. This is the only place that we find that reference. So when Jesus said this, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We don't have that in the mouth of Jesus anywhere else. So this, I mean, it's important. We're not saying this is not important. We're just saying this is not, our whole faith is not based on these verses. What about these signs? Uh, this is another reason why a lot of people today want to say that these verses are not original is because they know about these snake handler groups. They say, well, you know, they just really go off the deep end. Of course, we know that this is not even talking about the snake handling. This is not saying, oh, you need to go out and uh, pick up these venomous snakes like they do. Uh, that's not even what this is talking about. 
But nevertheless, these miracles that were promised to the to follow believers. Is this the only place we read about them? No, they're all attested in the book of Acts. Uh, even the picking up of sermons. I would refer that to, you know, what happened to Paul uh, when that, that venomous serpent fastened on his hand and he shook it off and they were waiting for him to die. But he didn't. I'd say that pretty well lines up with what Jesus said. What about the drinking of poison? Admittedly, that's difficult to interpret, isn't it? <laughs> we don't have anything in Acts that exactly lines up to that. Um, this is one of those uncertainties in interpretation where we say, well, there, it's there. We believe that Jesus said it. We don't exactly know how that came to pass. Um, just as an aside here, I thought this was interesting. There is an interesting early Christian report concerning the drinking of poison. Now, it's not part of the scriptures. So we're not, uh, this is not biblical testimony. It's a, it's a, a human testimony. But it is interesting this uh, right early Christian writer Eusebius, and he's relaying a report he uh, said he received from someone else. He wrote this, that Philip the Apostle resided in Hierapolis with his daughters has already been stated, but now it must be pointed out that Papias, their contemporary, recalls that he heard an amazing story from Philip's daughters. Well, we know about Philip's daughters from the scriptures. For he reports that in his day a man rose from the dead. And again, another amazing story involving Justice, who was surnamed Barsabbas. He drank a deadly poison, and yet by the grace of the Lord suffered nothing unpleasant. Now this would be the Justice that was uh, appointed alongside uh, Matthias as a potential successor to Judas. Now, as I said, this is just human testimony. We're not bound to believe that this miracle actually occurred because the, the scriptures don't attest to this particular event. But this is the kind of thing we would expect to see if what Jesus uh, promised really was uh, original, that he promised that people would drink deadly poison. So we're going to just uh, finish on that, uh, the longer ending of Mark. There are some books you could read, The Perspectives on the Ending of Mark. This is a good book. It kind of gives every person a different uh, take on the textual issue here. You can hear from all sides. Or this is a more recent book. This is really good. The Original Ending of Mark uh, by Nicholas Lunn. And he gives, uh, I think, really a, a decimation of that whole internal argument. And then he also shows how weak the external evidence is for rejecting these verses. And uh, this book, there was a, there's a well-known uh, biblical scholar named Craig Evans who wrote a commentary, you know, many years ago on the Gospel of Mark. He read Lund's book and this is what he said. Nicholas Lund has thoroughly shaken my views concerning the ending of the Gospel of Mark. As in the case of most Gospel scholars, I for my whole career held that Mark 16, 9 through 20, the so-called long ending, was not original. But in his well-researched and carefully argued book, Lund succeeds in showing just how flimsy that position really is. The evidence for the early existence of this ending, if not for its originality, is extensive and quite credible. I will not be surprised if Lund reverse his scholarly opinion on this important question. I urge scholars not to dismiss his arguments without carefully considering this excellent book. The original ending of Mark is must-reading for all concerned with the Gospels and early tradition concerned with the resurrection story. And again, this is not uh, a no-name biblical scholar. This is a well-known New Testament scholar who has written a commentary on the Gospel of Mark. There is a real case, an evidence-based case for these verses being original, and I say they belong in our Bible. They, uh, they're in the, the vast majority of Greek manuscripts, nearly every. Greek manuscript, and so they ought to, to be in our Bibles. But we can say this, regardless of the originality of these, of these verses, every believer can be assured that Jesus appeared to his disciples, that he ascended into heaven, and that the early believers were authenticated by the many miracles attested in the book of Acts. So we don't need to get the idea that, oh no, there's an uncertainty here. The whole thing could come crashing down. It couldn't. The whole thing's not resting on one, ver on one section. So, that's the first one. The big one, one of the two big ones. Here's the second big one. The woman taken in adultery. 
from the Gospel of John, uh, chapters uh, se uh, 7 and 8. The first, mainly the first part of chapter 8. So, the Textus Receptus and the Byzantine text contain the whole account as we're used to reading. Um, and the Byzantine text, mo uh, the vast majority of manuscripts also contain these verses. But the modern critical text does not. This is a, another 12 verse section that they say, well, this is not original to John. So here it is, uh, we're not going to read the whole thing. Here it is as it appears in the Textus Receptus and the Byzantine text. It speaks about uh, how every man went to his own house. We'll see about that in a moment. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and then he came into the temple and he was teaching. And then remember the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman and uh, you know, said, we found her uh, in the midst of uh, adultery. And he's, they're ready for Jesus to command to stone her. And you remember he said, uh, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all, and he began to write on the ground and they all uh, left and he resumed teaching. That's, we're, we're used to that. And you remember he, what he told the woman, uh, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. This is actually one of the most famous of events in the life of Jesus. People who are not even in church know that Jesus did this. Um, what, is, what, what do you have in the, uh, the critical Greek text? Well, it reads something like this. Uh, there's this section in the last part of chapter 7 that talks about, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Uh, and then the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. That's how it reads, according to this critical Greek text. And again, if you look in a modern version, this is typically what you would see. If you open an ESV, this is what you would find. Another uh, big note, the earliest manuscripts do not include 753 to 811. And also, this whole thing is in double brackets, which to those in the know, understand the translators do not view these as original to the Gospel of John. So why, what's the case against these verses? Why would you take these verses uh, and set them aside and do the double brackets and so forth? Well, um, the case is a little bit stronger than the one for uh, the longer ending, uh, uh, excuse me, the last 12 verses of Mark. Because several early manuscripts do not contain these verses, not only Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, but also there are two early papyri discovered in the 20th century that are in here uh, in Egypt, and uh, they don't contain it. Of course, these are really close relatives to Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And there's 15 other majuscules or early uh, manuscripts that don't have this uh, section. And then some of the early translations uh, do not contain these verses. So if you look at um, certain early translations, uh, these verses are not there, although in many there are, they are. And in some manuscripts, this, uh, this is what also raises questions in some of these scholars' mind, is that this passage ends up being put in different places in a handful of manuscripts. So it may not always appear in John 8. Uh, and in fact, in one manuscript, it appears in the Gospel of Luke. They say, well, how do you ex explain this? They say, well, this is just a, a text searching for a home in history. That's the explanation. And then again, they said this. This has 15 words not appearing anywhere else in John. So therefore, someone else wrote this. They say this has someone else's style. Take this all together. That's enough to convince uh, critical scholars. They say, well, yeah, this is not original. But what about the case for these verses? Uh, for every evidence-based argument, there is an evidence-based counter-argument. What is it? Well, 
first off, about 85% of the Greek manuscripts that we have today, including 16 of these earlier type majuscules, do contain this uh, whole passage. So it is in the majority of uh, the Greek manuscripts. What about those early witnesses that don't contain it? Well, one important thing we have to keep in mind is that they are all basically related. They're all part of this Alexandrian text type. So uh, that's just the fact that they don't have it. Um, you have to weigh, because they are related, how much that bears. And then what about this, uh, the text being put in different places? How do you explain that? Or it's having these special marks. People have looked at this, and uh, actually there's a good case to be made that the reason that it has these different places and the marks is uh, because of the lectionaries. We mentioned that a couple of times, uh, a couple of times ago. Basically, there were uh, schedules for reading certain passages at certain dates of the year, and uh, some did not include, some of the readings that were scheduled did not include these verses, and that explains why there were certain marks that said to the, the daily reader, you know, stop here and then pick it up back down here. Um, and that's also, you can see other passages that kind of get moved around because of this lectionary influence. Uh, it gets uh, kind of com complicated, but there, anyway, there's a good explanation for why that might have occurred. And so, again, omission seems to be a more plausible explanation than insertion. What do I mean by that? Well, it would be difficult for 12 verses original to the Gospel of John to be omitted. That would be difficult to do. People would say, well, where are these verses? We're used to hearing about this. Why? Where did they go? The scribes who were familiar with this would say, wait a second, this doesn't have these verses. So it would be difficult to uh, omit these. But it would be considerably more difficult for 12 verses not original to John to just end up being inserted right in the middle of the gospel uh, and then go on to be widely received by everyone. How could you do that? They'd say, wait, where did this come from? I've never heard this story in my life. <laughs> you just made this and, and fit it in here? That would be much more difficult. But if they're not original, that's what had to have happened. So I, to say that it's probably someone in an early line of transmission just omitted these is probably a more reasonable explanation. And you know what? There are, is actually a early uh, Christian testimony that there were some scribes who did just that. So uh, Augustine, writing around the year 400, he wrote this about this passage of Scripture. He said, Certain persons of little faith, or rather enemies of the true faith, fearing, I suppose, lest their wives should be given impunity in sinning, removed from the manuscripts the Lord's act of forgiveness toward, toward the adulteress, as if he who had said sin no more had granted permission to sin. Here's someone writing around 400 who says, I know there's been some people who have removed this from their manuscripts. There you go. And so that means originally it was there and someone removed it. Now, if you talk to, this, to, to, to text critics about this, they say, well, he didn't know anything. He's just speculating. And I mean, he's a lot closer to it than you and I are. Uh, uh, I, and I think that's the, probably the most plausible explanation about, and he, this is a contemporary witness of um, basically what, what happened here. What about those unique words? Again, the fact that there is this number of unique words, people hear that and say, oh man, that proves it. So this passage uh, about the woman taking adultery has 15 unique words not found anywhere else in John in these 12 verses. But if you look at other sections, uh, and there's a section in 1 John that has 11 unique words and 14 verses, and no one doubts those are original. There's a passage in John 2 that has 19 unique words and 13 verses. No one doubts that that passage is original. There's a passage in John 6 that has 13 unique words and 12 verses. This is a nothing burger. This doesn't mean that, uh, that this is not original. This is just an internal speculation uh, of men. And there's other important reasons. Excluding this passage seems to leave the text with a jarring discontinuity. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm saying uh, the internal evidence is that this passage really does belong where, where it is. Why? 
Well, let's look at how it flows. This is how the narrative flows with the pericope adultery, or this woman taken adultery. You have Jesus teaching publicly at the end of chapter 7. And then you have this other uh, segment where it talks about the officers conferring with the chief priests and the Pharisees about the arrest of Jesus. Now, is Jesus there? No, he is not. He's not in this meeting with the scribes and the Pharisees. They're talking about him. And then what do these men do? They all go home. Then Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus teaches in the temple. He gets set up and he's beginning to teach. And then what happens? The scribes and the Pharisees bring the woman taken in adultery to Jesus. And then at one by one, they all leave. But not everyone left, just those who accuse the woman because what? Jesus continues teaching in the temple. He just picks up where he left off. Uh, and that all makes sense. So if you look here, um, he, uh, it says in verse 2, And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And of course the scribes and Pharisees bring the woman, and then they leave. And then he picks it up. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. So when Jesus says again, uh, or when John says Jesus spoke again to them, what does that mean? That means he spoke again to the people he's teaching in the temple. The other people came and kind of did this little disturbance. They're gone. And then Jesus speaks again to the people in the temple. Makes total sense. Well, how does it flow without the, per, this, uh, this pericope? You have Jesus teaching publicly. Then you have this meeting, the officers conferring with the chief priests and the Pharisees. And that's followed right up with Jesus teaching in the temple, beginning in verse 12. How does that read? You would have, it ends up being like this. Then came the officers, the chief priests, and the Pharisees. They have their meeting. And then at the end of this, it says, They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Now hold on. Rewind. What does it mean? What do again and them mean now? Well, them would have to be talking about the Pharisees. But he hadn't been talking to the Pharisees. He's been talking to them. He's been teaching the people. Uh, this would be the first time he's speaking you know, to the Pharisees. Um, you see, there's a discontinuity here created to where the narrative begins to lack sense. That's evidence for the fact that these verses belong where they are. Um, so, excluding the passage seems to leave the text with this jarring discontinuity, but including the passage creates a sensible, continuous narrative. That's another piece of evidence why this does belong in our Bibles. And this is, this is what seals the deal for me. This passage, as it stands in the Gospel of John, is simply too brilliant and too fitting to be the spurious work of an uninspired scribe. To think that someone just came up with this and invented this story. It is too good. It is too perfect. Um, it fits, it does fit the Gospel of John like a glove. Because what is it that John wrote in the beginning in chapter 1? He said, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What better demonstration of this was there than the woman taken in adultery? Because he, at, the one, at the one hand, he, he didn't uh, come to destroy the Mosaic law. He actually literally upheld it. But at the same time, he extended mercy and grace to this woman. Uh, I don't think someone could have just invented this account and added it to the gospel. And it just happens to fit perfectly where it is. That, uh, that strains uh, the imagination. If you want to read further, there's some books about this. Uh, this is another kind of a uh, multiple view book, The Pericope of the Adulteress in Contemporary Research. Um, and then this is another uh, pretty good book by James Snap, A Fresh Analysis of 750, John 7.53 through 8.11. Now, what about the impact of this? Whether, we, whether people exclude this or include this, how much is riding on this? Is our whole faith riding upon the woman taking the adultery? Well, no. It does relate what would be an important incident in the ministry of Jesus. This is something that would be important. And there's one other thing. This passage also provides unique testimony regarding Jesus' literacy. This is the only place uh, in the New Testament where Jesus is writing. So this shows us 
This would be the only window we would have into that aspect that Jesus was able to write. Of course, we have other indications that he could read, such as he did in the synagogue. But as far as his writing, this would be important for that. Nevertheless, no doctrine is affected by the question of this passage's originality to John. Uh, that's not, uh, again, that's not to say that it's not important. It is. But to say that our faith and practice is relying on this verse, that, or this passage, that's not the case. It's not. Um, we're going to have to stop here. We've only been able to look at these first two big ones. But I just want, these are the biggest ones, I'm telling you. And uh, really, that ought to be comforting. This, they're important. But it's not like the whole, our whole faith is in jeopardy. That's, there's nothing in the variance that is going to overturn the core central doctrines of our faith, in particular what it says about Christ. That is solid, completely established, no matter how you slice it. So God has preserved his word, and we can rest in that. All right, thank you for your attention.